Welcome to our Federalist Society event on piracy law. Today we are honored to welcome Professor Eugene Kantorovich and of George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School and Professor David Bosco of Indiana University's Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies. Professor Kantorovich is one of the world's leading experts on universal jurisdiction and maritime piracy, as well as the Israel-Arab conflict. He joined Scalia Law School from Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law. He has published over 30 major articles and book chapters in major law reviews, and he attended the University of Chicago for college and law school, and after that, he clerked for the renowned Judge Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit. Professor Bosco specializes in political the, the political dynamics of international organizations and international law, specifically the UN Security Council and the International Criminal Court. He has written two books on international law and is currently in the process of writing a book on ocean governance. He attended Harvard for college and as well as law school, and after graduating, he worked for the firm Cleary Gottlieb before becoming a senior editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, where he remains a contributing editor. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest to speak on the fascinating topic of piracy. So did we get to go in any order? We all right. Maybe I'll maybe I'll lead off. Yeah, that's yeah, all right. Exactly. Okay. Because I'm going to, uh, well, first, it's really a pleasure to be here um, with you. And also, this is actually the first time that we've met in person. We've interacted frequently on Twitter. And blogs. And blogs and various other media. But, um, but it's, it's a real pleasure. And I think it's a real treat for you guys uh, to have him here because um, he uh, really is one of the leading scholars in a variety of different areas including the International Criminal Court, and I would not be averse to this at some point becoming... Oh, we can switch over. There may be, a, in midstream, we could switch over and talk a little bit about the International Criminal Court, which kind of is related to piracy, a little bit. We'll try, we'll try to tie it in. Um, in any case, um, my talk is... Uh, remarks is a better way of uh, phrasing it. My remarks are going to be kind of uh, more 30,000-foot level about... Um, ocean governance, uh, and obviously piracy is a part of that. Um, but what I thought I would do is talk to you a little bit about the way I'm approaching uh, the issue with this book. Um, and specifically, I think what attracted me to this subject was the feeling that, and this is true for other books I've, I've written, um, the feeling that there wasn't really a very accessible general book, if you wanted to go learn about ocean governance and law of the sea, you very quickly got into the weeds in such a way that it was uh, hard to make it through. And um, so the, the goal with this book is to present a kind of accessible history of ocean government, uh, over, ocean governance and law of the sea, um, and, uh, and that's what I'm kind of in the midst of. And I have to give a shout out to Rachel, who's been helping me a little bit uh, on my project. Um, and probably will do more in the future if she's willing. Um, but uh, the, the centerpiece for me of the project has become the concept of freedom of the seas. Um, and I think uh, what I'm trying to do really is trace how the doctrine of freedom of the seas has evolved over time. Um, and so I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about that concept because, and I think it would be particularly relevant for, for this group, my overall argument is that freedom of the seas is disappearing, um, is essentially being picked apart piece by piece. Um, but before I kind of get into how I think that's happening, and by the way, in saying that, I don't want to actually say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a complicated thing. Um, I think there's, there's some real complexities there, uh, but I really just want to kind of describe that phenomenon. But I, I do want to say a, a word about the emergence of the freedom of the seas, which I think is a, uh, a concept that is particularly resonant for the United States historically. Um, you know, if we look back at going from Woodrow Wilson to Franklin Roosevelt all the way up through every recent administration, you will see in national security strategies, in uh, documents relating to the oceans, freedom of the seas is kind of a touchstone. Um, 
And operationally, it's a touchstone as well. So when the U.S. Navy goes out uh, and is patrolling in the South China Sea or in various areas, uh, naval commanders are always talking about a central mission for the Navy as preserving freedom of the seas. But what does that concept mean exactly? Where did it uh, emerge from? So historically speaking, the doctrine really emerged uh, as a function of competition between the Spanish and Portuguese on the one hand and the Dutch on the other. Um, and so this was kind of the era of uh, exploration, um, the knowledge about the scope of the oceans uh, grew considerably in the late 1400s, early 1500s, the great voyages of, of discovery. Um, and as the Portuguese figured out that they could round the Cape, uh, round uh, the Africa and end up in the Indian Ocean, they did something which was not um, totally out of character. Uh, they said, it's ours. The Indian Ocean is ours. Um, and they actually had the ability to make that stick, in large part because of naval technology that they had that others didn't. Um, and they were able to institute a system of what they called cartazes, or essentially passes that you had if you were going to be transiting the Indian Ocean. You had to show that to you know, the Portuguese patrols that were operating there. Obviously, they weren't able to exercise total dominion, um, but they certainly claimed to control the Indian Ocean, whether they claim to own it in the same way that you own the land or own your territory is, I would say, a little bit murky. Um, but they certainly claimed kind of control. And the Spanish uh, were, in, in a somewhat different way, making claims about the, the broader Atlantic, and there was a pape, the, the Pope got involved, and there was a kind of dividing line that was established between the Spanish domain and the Portuguese domain, the, the famous Treaty of Tordesillas, um, which undoubtedly you all have uh, studied. Um, and, um, and so we, we had the concept that you could kind of divide up the oceans between sovereign powers. And that kind of worked its way um, However, as the Dutch rose as an economic power, they were very eager to get into the Indian Ocean trade, and they started sending ships there, the Dutch East India Company, um, and you had the kind of inevitable clashes between the Portuguese and the Dutch, um, with uh, a number of Dutch sh ships being um, taken and captives being taken, some some Dutch sailors were executed, and eventually the Dutch decided they were going to retaliate, um, and so they figured out uh, a time when a, a Portuguese uh, vessel loaded with spices and other uh, lucrative goods was going to be vulnerable. They seized it, they sailed it back to Amsterdam, and auctioned it off. Um, and at that point, the Dutch realized that they needed a good lawyer. Um, because actually legal argumentation mattered to some degree. The Dutch were trying to make an argument about their rights in the Indian Ocean uh, that would be persuasive to other European sovereigns. Um, and they, they, didn't, they obviously wanted to act, but they also wanted to present some kind of defense of, of why what they did was legitimate. And that is where uh, Hugo Grotius enters the picture, um, and he was a kind of, I think he, at that point he was like 21 years old. He always makes me feel bad about what I've done in my life. But um, he, was, he was 21 years old, I think, and was a kind of legal prodigy and was tasked uh, by the Dutch with coming up with a legal defense of the Dutch action. And that legal defense, uh, which was initially published anonymously, becomes uh, Mare Liberum, or the Free Sea. Um, and that 
is really the roots of the doctrine of freedom of the seas. And what Grotius's argument, uh, Grotius's argument took a variety of forms, and it was kind of a natural law argument, which was interesting. Um, he's, Grotius is seen as one of the kind of more influential people in developing the tradition of natural law uh, as a form of legal argumentation rather than, say, scripture which is what many legal scholars at the time would have relied on. But Grotius made his argument based on the nature of the oceans and why the nature of the oceans was such that you can't claim it. You can't own it, he said, uh, because it's fluid, um, because the resources of the sea, he said, are inexhaustible, which we've managed to prove incorrect. Um, but, um, and, you know, you, you simply can't, you can't make lines in the ocean the way you can make lines in the land. And so there were a variety of different arguments that Grotius made, but that was the argument for freedom of the seas. And that argument was so powerful and so persuasive that it really kind of worked its way through history um, and has emerged uh, into the present day as a powerful, although as I will argue, uh, a doctrine that is under assault. Um, the British, as they became the dominant naval power, um, picked up on the doctrine, came to see themselves as kind of the defender of freedom of the seas, although there were many blots on the British record as a, uh, as a kind of impartial defender of freedom of the seas, but nonetheless they saw themselves as, as uh, the defender of that. And then in the wake of the British, the United States in a way has emerged then as the kind of leading defender of freedom of the seas. Let me give you a, a kind of very rough working definition of what we mean by freedom of the seas. Um, now this has obviously varied somewhat over time, but I think there are a couple elements here that are clear. First is freedom to navigate. Okay, so freedom of the seas means freedom to navigate where you want, when you want. Um, it means the freedom to exploit the resources of the sea. Okay, so that you can go out and take what you want from the sea. Uh, obviously, fish being what was most on people's minds at that point. In modern terms, of course, now we start to think about oil and gas, and we think about uh, potential uh, mineral wealth that's on the seabed. And so the, the idea of the resources of the sea has a much different flavor today than it did at that time. Um, so freedom to navigate, freedom to fish, and, and exploit the resources of the sea. And then a third element... And this is one where the British were really quite important, was an insistence that while it is legitimate for countries to claim a very narrow band of ocean near the coast, near their coast, it is not legitimate to go beyond that and to claim, more, to claim any parts of the open ocean. Okay? And that was the British were really very aggressive defenders during the kind of Pax Britannica period of the idea of a three-mile territorial sea. That that was the band you could have. Beyond that was the open ocean, and you should not be claiming the open ocean. And so periodically, countries, and here, um, you know, the, the Scandinavian countries, Russia occasionally, would try to claim more would try to say, we can take six miles, we can take 12 miles. And the British were very aggressive and very persistent about trying to slap down those claims uh, using a variety of, of different means. Okay, So freedom to navigate, freedom to fish, the um, unacceptability of claims to the open ocean. Those, I would say, are three pillars of, of freedom of the seas. But then there's a fourth, and this is where Professor Kontorovich is... Um, is really expert, those three freedoms, I would say, are kind of negative in nature, right? So long as somebody's not interfering with your freedom to fish, so long as somebody's not interfering with your freedom to navigate, and so long as somebody's not making claims to the open ocean, they can be respecting freedom of the sea. But in order to have meaningful freedom of the sea, there's a fourth element, I would argue, which is that you've got to have some semblance of order some uh, suppression of violence on the oceans. 
Um, because otherwise, you have freedom in a kind of Lord of the Flies sense, um, but you don't have a kind of usable freedom. Okay, so there's a positive element here, which is that somebody has to provide some semblance of order. Um, that, as you can imagine, is kind can become intention with some of the other elements, because once you have a force out there imposing order, they could be awfully tempted in various situations to interfere with some of, to breach some of the other pillars of freedom of the seas. So that, for, for me, is kind of a working historical definition of what we mean by freedom of the seas. <clears throat> Why do I say that freedom of the seas is being picked apart? I would argue that all of those, but particularly the first three of those elements, have been under strain uh, in various ways, um, and some of them are really disappearing entirely. So let's talk about, let's maybe talk first about the idea that you shouldn't be claiming the open ocean. What we've seen in historical terms is, but particularly in the 20th century and, and to today, is a breakdown of the idea that all coastal states can claim is a narrow band near the ocean, uh, near the coast, okay? And that broke down in a variety of ways, um, but the United States actually played an important role in that with the Truman proclamations of 1945, uh, which said that the United States could uh, control the seabed um, out significantly into the ocean, and a claim that the United States could um, exert a kind of or, or play a fishing regulatory role of some sort. There was some ambiguity in the Truman Proclamation out to a distance well beyond the traditional edge of the territorial sea. The Truman Proclamation was followed by a veritable uh, cascade of additional state claims to ocean space. And the Latin American, a number of Latin American countries were among the most aggressive here who said, you know, they said essentially, all right, great, game on. The British idea that you can only claim three miles is gone. The Americans have, have essentially acknowledged as much with the Truman proclamations. We are now going to claim a vast territorial sea going out to 200 miles, perhaps. And so that happens, and during the period of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, we have expanding state claims to the oceans. Um, and uh, what we've had is that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was negotiated in the 1970s, attempts to put some restraint on that, uh, limits to a 12-mile territorial sea, but you have a 200-mile uh, economic zone. Briefly... Freedom to uh, fish uh, and exploit the resources of the sea has also been under significant strain. Um, in increasing international regulation through a variety of forms, which we can discuss if you're interested, uh, on the freedom to fish. And there are negotiations right now going on up, at the, um, uh, up in New York on uh, the additional restrictions that may be placed on activities that can be conducted um, on the high seas. Um, and, and then in a variety of other ways, many of which I don't want to go into at this point, the basic idea that the open ocean is free for all to use has been under strain, um, and environmental reasons here are very powerful reasons. And so I would argue that, historically speaking, what we are watching is the eroding away of the doctrine of freedom of the seas um, China is posing a particularly interesting challenge uh, through some of their claims in the South China Sea, which go well beyond the framework of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and essentially go to the ability of states to conduct normal naval operations in areas that they claim of the South China Sea. And so there are a variety of different ways is under threat. I don't think this has been fully acknowledged or dealt with, and I think it's a really interesting dynamic because, as I indicated at the outset, the United States is the, the country for which freedom of the seas is most resonant and to which uh, the, United States, the United States is very wedded to the idea of freedom of the seas rhetorically, and it's crumbling from underneath, 
And I think how this plays out with the United States is going to be particularly interesting to watch. So with that kind of broad overview, let me hand off to Professor Kontorovic. Thank you so much. Uh, David, it was really great um, uh, hearing that, and I'm really happy that you're writing a book about ocean governance in a way that will be accessible, because to most people, uh, the law of the sea is unclose, and you're going to bring it closer. Right. You know? <laughs> unclose is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the main treaty uh, in this area. Okay, that's maritime, maritime law humor, humor is hard. Um, but anyway, I'm glad you guys are sitting all where you're sitting because I call on people from the back uh, in. Um, no, no one's going to be called on. Uh, the maritime piracy is a, is a concrete aspect of, of the law of the sea. It's one of the interesting aspects of the law of the sea treaty, which is this huge treaty that governs territorial claims, uh, mining, all sorts of different kinds of activities, uh, and is a highly regulatory treaty, also has in it criminal law components, right? individual crimes uh, that people can commit, in particular one crime, the crime uh, of piracy, uh, which is a crime within the law of the sea. And the law of the sea, it's an area where the law of the sea and international, law, international criminal law uh, intersect because piracy is the first international crime. Before war crimes and genocide and slave trade and appropriation of cultural artifacts in wartime, whatever else people want to say are war crimes today, uh, piracy was the first and is the longest international crime and remains so today. Uh, recently, piracy, uh, especially uh, in the Gulf of Aden and in the Indian Ocean, had a big renewal, uh, this ancient crime which led to an interesting challenge how modern international regulation and international criminal law would meet this very old challenge. I'm going to tell this story briefly, in particular with an eye to our context here. Uh, we're being hosted by the Federalist Society, and I think we can learn some things about the rise and fall of modern uh, Gulf of Aden Gulf of India piracy, also known as Somali piracy, uh, some uh, lessons uh, that are very much in the spirit of the Federalist Society about the uh, competition between private and governmental ordering. So first, what is privacy? piracy? Uh, piracy is simply robbery on the high seas. Yeah. Piracy, you don't have to chop people's heads off or make them walk the plank. And typical pir pirates don't always do that. Um, depends on the nature of the situation. Uh, but the, uh, and in particular, the pirates we're talking about were not, were not particularly violent. Uh, it's robbery. Robbery is the essence of piracy. Uh, and it is when you go from one vessel to another vessel, that's an important technical requirement, on the high seas. Now, and the pirates have since the 1600s been called in international law hostis humanity generis, the enemies of all mankind. Oh, that sounds bad. And they're so bad that any country can prosecute pirates that it comes across on the high seas in its courts. They're subject to universal jurisdiction. Right? Them and people who commit genocide. So what makes piracy so bad? So it's not that it's so bad in a moral sense. It's as bad as robbery, however bad that is. It's that it's hard to prevent and hard to punish. It's like horse thievery. Right? You've seen Westerns, they hang the horse thieves. Why is horse thievery such a big deal? Not because horse thievery is so terrible. How bad is it? It's as bad as stealing a horse. Right. Horse thievery is difficult to prevent. People ride around on their horses and they tie them up and the horse by itself, you know, is mobile. So it's like, it would be like car thievery if cars didn't need ignition switches and, you know, keys. Everyone would be driving away with everyone's cars. You'd have to have a very strict system to make sure people were not driving away with each other's cars. Uh, if you, so that's, and ho ho horses were very, very, very much like that. So you need strict penalties to prevent uh, high value but opportunistic crime. And piracy is a high value opportunistic crime. You can make a lot of money, 
and there are many targets of, uh, of convenience. The, so international law treats it strictly because on the high seas, there's no police around necessarily. Aside from the question of jurisdiction, all sorts of things can happen, and so you need significant ex post remedies, uh, ex, uh, ex, post pun uh, ex post punishments. The And so the law of the sea treaty provides that piracy is the one crime that any country can punish, any country can in particular, and this is a limitation on the freedom of the seas. One of the great assumptions of the freedom of the seas uh, Professor Bosco was speaking about is a ship cannot be disturbed upon its voyage. Go around, right? It's not like if you're driving down the uh, interstate and the police can stop you for various reasons and check, the, you, know, check you out. No, you can't be stopped. You're going to go about your business. And there's a very short list of reasons that you can be stopped and what's called visited, which is a nice international law way of saying searched, boarded and searched, uh, by uh, a navy. And that, that visit is limited to a few things. Piracy is one of the main things that give you a right to visit. And the right to visit, it sounds like, what's the big deal? That right can often be abused if not uh, carefully managed. There was a case involving a Greenpeace vis vessel recently where uh, Russia claimed that the Greenpeace vessel was engaged in acts of piracy, which was a fairly ludicrous claim, uh, and they boarded it. The Russian Navy boarded it, on, saying, we think there might be piracy going on. And then they said, oh, well, it turns out there is no piracy going on, but we found a joint in like one of the people's lockers. We're, we're taking them all in, and we're prosecuting them for drug trafficking. So the right to disturb, uh, and presumably that could be found on a large number of vessels, so the, the right to stop a vessel and search it is a significant interference. Ah, one other point to understand in this respect, in the maritime world, if you're a day late, you're more than a dollar short. So being stopped, if you're late, wherever you're going, the ships uh, have cargoes and there are many interlocking contracts between what gets delivered and offloaded when, and then when it turns around. And there's contracts with many different complicated parties, and there's insurance on those contracts. If you're a day late, all sorts of dominoes start falling in a bad way. So, but an exception is made for piracy. Piracy is very important. So piracy had stopped being a problem for um, a variety of reasons. It had stopped being a large-scale problem, uh, mostly to do with vehicle registration and improvements in vehicle tracking. It's harder to pass off a ship that you steal. Uh, but then, due to a change and improvement in business model, uh, some Somalis found a way to make piracy profitable, and it really took off in the Gulf of Aden. And here's the thing. The high seas are often not so high. Much, most of the world's shipping has to pass through a few select transit points, one of them being the Gulf of Aden, between Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, uh, on their way. And so in this area, there's lots of lots of ships. They have to slow down because there's a lot of traffic. So they're going around a corner. And the pirates will take little boats out from Somalia, jump on these ships, seize them, and make a lot of money. They would ransom them back to the insurance companies, typically, uh, often for millions of dollars. And many, many vessels started getting seized. Dozens. And many more, and this had a huge economic effect, because apart from the vessels that get seized, others have to change their routes and navigate differently. It was a big deal. Lots of crews were held hostage for a very long time. And this became the international law, international cooperation topic du jour. The Security Council had several meetings on it. The UN General Secretary wrote a report, and it, it seemed like a beautiful model of international cooperation because dozens of countries pledged to send their vessels to suppress the Somali piracy. Uh, the EU sent a naval force, which is still there. Uh, NATO sent a naval force. The pirates are gone, but the, the EU mission is still there. NATO sent a force. China sent its first out-of-region maritime deployment in 500 years. Um, South Korea sent ships, um, Gulf Cooperation Council, Arab states sent ships. It was like a, a beautiful UN of everyone, and they were all on the radio together with good naval cooperation talking about looking for the pirates. Nonetheless, 
piracy persisted. Why did this great naval show of strength not make an immediate dent, not just put down the pirates? Two reasons, two main reasons. First of all, taking back a little bit what I said, the high seas is not so high, but it's high enough. Even in the Gulf of Aden, there's a lot of water there. And the pirate ships need very little time. They move very, uh, they move very fast. The chance of any one naval vessel being able to respond in time before a, uh, a ship is boarded were relatively small. They could, of course, get there soon after, but then it's a hostage situation. And no one wants to mess with that. The insurers get on the phone. They say, please don't do anything. So really, to prevent the, the boarding, you need to be very fast, and that was very hard to do. That's one problem. But the second problem was to suppress piracy. It's not enough just to like get there and catch them. You need to do something to them that will deter them. And it turns out that what was happening was these NATO, the EU, they were no match for the pirates. They were catching them left and right. They were catching them before they boarded. They were catching them just sailing around. They would see them from helicopters on motherships, and they would catch them. And then they would let them go. Over and over and over and over. It was an official policy called catch and release. And European countries in particular told their navies, don't even let them on your ship. Don't even let them on the ship, because then they will be eligible to file for asylum and have other kinds of claims. Uh, certainly don't bring them back for trial. Even though they're hostile to many generous, there was one trial, we were talking about Hamburg, there was a trial in Hamburg, Germany's first piracy trial in 400 years. It lasted a year and a half and included 120 court dates. Um, if you want to know uh, how expensive 120 court dates are in Germany, it's like having 120 federal court dates here. It's really, really expensive. They need the special translators for the pirate, for the, where the witnesses, where are the witnesses. Uh, it was very difficult to prosecute. Nobody wants that cost. Nobody was willing to pay that cost. But wait, I thought pirates were the enemies of mankind, and everyone has to, uh, UNCLOS, the treaty, says everyone has a duty to cooperate and suppress them rather than catch them and give them a ride back to Somalia, as was being, uh, as was being done. But here's, here's the problem. When you have a global problem, you have a built-in commons problem. To say that they're the enemies of everyone, and it's so bad and it's a violation of international law, that just says it's somebody else's problem. That just says it's somebody else's problem. And when the costs of prosecuting are high, as they were in this case, for logistical reasons, and the benefits are going to be spread out uh, across the whole world, let someone else do it. Let someone else do it. And we see that even a normative, one of the lessons here is even a normative commitment to sort of internationalist ideals, this is very bad, we all need to cooperate, which everyone shares. It's quite clear. There's no one who believes in piracy. Countries' efforts to engage in real concrete costs are greatly limited by their own national self-interest. Now, you may know there were many pirates prosecuted in America, right? You know about those guys out in Richmond? So why were those guys prosecuted in America? Because they happened to accidentally, that is to say not with particular targeting purpose, attack U.S. ships. So for sure, the U.S. went, they got every single pilot that attacked a U.S. ship. They did not miss a single one. If Belgium went and got every pirate that attacked a Belgian ship. They went to extraordinary lengths. There was this guy, what was his name? He had a funny name, like um, Smiley or something about his teeth. Um, they, uh, he was a pirate kingpin. And the Belgian intelligence launched this operation where they got this woman who was a documentary filmmaker to call up and say, you're like so cool, you're like a hard man, and we want to make a documentary about you, but like in Belgium. <laughs> and so the guy said, no, I don't want to go to Belgium, I'm a Somali pirate. He goes, no, 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 you're going to be the hero of this documentary, how you're like fighting the Western imperialist fishing system. Okay. So anyway, so it goes to Belgium and turns out... Um, so, but that's a, that was a very big production for uh, Belgium. Why? Because this guy had attacked a Belgian ship. They catch him attacking a Korean ship, bye-bye. You're back in the water. So nominal internationalization, making treaties, saying these are going to be international crimes, doesn't, in the end, 
necessarily overcome nations' limitations of uh, self-interest. That's one thing. So why do we not see Somali pirates today if they were just being caught and released, caught and released? So some indeed did get prosecuted because they attacked the wrong country's ships. Um, the Many were prosecuted for attacking U.S. vessels. Uh, just They did not know they were U.S. US naval vessels by complete mistake. Um, the... Why were the pirates attacking these ships in the first place? So initially, when the pirates started, they were doing this because it made so much sense. As about a third of the world's shipping, a quarter of the world's shipping, goes to the Gulf of Aden. There are ships worth a ton of money, hundreds of millions of dollars each. Pirates, average Somali gets, makes $400 a year. And the ships are dro- sailing by, sailing by. They were, they were entirely unsecured. So the ships, they had no security on board. There, were, there was no, ar- they had no arms on board. They were completely defenseless. That's why they always gave up. That's why the pirates didn't have to shoot anyone. Uh, the pirates came on board with AK-47s by the end of the story. Now, why were the ships unarmed? Why were the ships unarmed? The reason is because there's no international second amendment. Basic, the basic reason. So ships sail around and they have to stop in lots of different ports. And then they're completely subject to the jurisdiction of that country. Those countries do not have Second Amendments often. And so they would be in violation of gun laws of the countries they stop in. Also, many European countries that are prominent flag carriers have very, very strict gun laws, which they apply to their ships. Britain, Germany, you're not allowed to have guns. So if you're not allowed to have guns in Hamburg, you're also not going to be allowed to have guns on a German vessel. Uh, so private, when private security first got on, when got on, I heard an amazing story from a guy who was invo- involved in this. Many security contractors started going to try to protect the ships in, in various ways. For a while, they were doing crazy stuff, like the, a helicopter would drop like a big padded bag of pistols on the vessel, where they would already have an embarked security d- detail, after it transited the canal. Then, when they were through the Gulf of Aden and felt they safe, they'd toss them overboard before they came into their first port. Now, that's a big um, production. So eventually, countries began to... And, what, what, and why did countries not immediately stop? Because we know guns make problems happen. We don't have guns. You know, if the Somali pirates have guns and the ships have guns, there are going to be more problems. But eventually, flag states, in particular the UK, was very influential. That's where all the insurance companies are based. So they have an outsized role in this. Um, the UK, Germany, um, Scandinavian countries, they're all extremely influential in this. They came around to relaxing these rules and in various ways licensing, authorizing, making various exceptions, finding solutions to allow for armed security on vessels. Within a year or two of the broad adoption of armed security details, and they, don't, they need not be big. It doesn't take much. One or two or three, three people. Um, in fact, it's very easy to secure a vessel. But really, it was their radical unsecuritization that made them um, vulnerable targets. But actually, if, if there's an armed detail on a ship, it's very hard to board it from a much... You know, it's a much higher platform, um, much more stable... Or these little dinghies. Um, so, M- Somali piracy collapsed overnight. Collapsed and to basically nothing. So, in other words, the solution that was found was not the EU naval force, which is still there, uh, or all these other naval forces, uh, or the, you know, they no doubt played a helpful role. But in the end, the solution was private regulation because the government can't be everywhere, everywhere. The Navy can't be everywhere, everywhere. And in the end, the bottom-down solution that was, uh, came from the shippers and the insurers was what put an end to uh, Somali piracy or made it at least less attractive to the, the people participating than uh, other, other, other kinds of activities. We've gone on too long. You must have pirate questions. Everybody likes pirates. I'm going to say, Except if anybody has to leave for class, I understand, but if you have when's, any... When's if, the next class? Uh, 
coming up soon, but if anybody has any questions, now is the time for it. You must. Yes. Attacking a what? What is it? Belgian. So, in the, countries are very protective of their national vessels. And the Belgian case was there was an attack on a, pro, uh, on a, on a private vessel. Uh, South Korea sent commandos to take over a, a vessel, a uh, South Korean vessel with pirate, that pirates had seized. Naval commandos that came down in helicopters. They took them all back to Korea, which is a really long trip for prosecution. They were very serious about it. The U.S. cases were different because the pirates actually accidentally fired on warships. And then they were just blasted out of the water, most of them. The, the, that is to say, the ones who were prosecuted were the, the, the few survivors of a... Uh, uh, mo- that that stra- it's, it doesn't work well. It, it ends very, very poorly. Um, that's why I say by a- mistakenly, they, they did not understand what they were shooting at. They thought it was a commercial vessel. They're not, they're not sitting there with Jane's ships of the world. Uh, they didn't really... Um, no. But one point that might be helpful here is that um, it's required that every ocean-going ship be flagged. And so there's when you – the premise of your question was there's such thing as a private ship. There is no such thing. Every ship carries a national flag um, and therefore is considered the territory of whatever flag it's flying. But one of the complexities, to add a little bit to Professor Kontorovich's story, is that you most – I think it's fair to say most shipping is flagged by what is called a flag of convenience country. Um, So for a variety of regulatory reasons, um, uh, financial reasons, commercial vessels typically pick a uh, flag of convenience state, historically Panama, Liberia, but then you've got the Maldives, Mauritius, you know, a variety of others. One of the interesting points is that these countries have no real enforcement ability or ability to protect their ships. Um, whereas, you know, a U.S. flagged ship is going to be protected by the might of the United States. Um, and so that flag of convenience system is part of the picture here, which is there's a radical disconnect in the way the oceans are governed because of the flag of convenience system uh, and the lack of power behind maritime power behind the tonnage that is shipped under a certain flag. Yeah, an interesting thing happened with flags of convenience in this, uh, in this situation. The, there, are no, there are almost no U.S. flag vessels. Yeah. Uh, the, the way the flagging works is you, are, you have to follow the regulations of your flag state. So you, fla- you get a Liberian flag because you would rather do Liberian employment regulations, environmental regulations, uh, disability regulations, than American re- regulations. And I was very much of the view um, at the time that the argument made by the American Merchant Mariners Association was correct, that America should actually not protect U.S. vessels in the sense of owned by a U.S. corporation that have chosen a foreign flag because it's a package deal. I got nothing against this package, but you can, you can go for the premium model, mm-hmm. which is America, which is very high taxes, high fees, lots of regulatory compliance extraordinary back-end security like no one else, or you go for the Liberian model, you're paying nothing, but then why should the American Navy come at American taxpayer expense and go and protect your ships? But in the end, apparently the pull or political clout or emotional appeal um, of national connection was very strong because, for example, in the Korean case, it was not a Korean flagged vessel. There are no such things as your own flagged vessel anymore for major Western countries. Uh, industrial co- industrial countries, but nonetheless, um, the home country would often come to uh, the rescue uh, when it when it could. Yeah. Yes, Charlie. So uh, Saudi Arabian.
Yeah, and that's an idea that has a historical precedent because during the tanker wars of the 1980s, during the Iran-Iraq war, um, a lot of Kuwaiti-flagged vessels were falling prey to various forms of attack by Iran or Iraq. Um, and what the U.S. ended up with was they reflagged those Kuwaiti tankers. Um, and it actually it involves some really interesting legal complex. I think they, the, the vessels technically had to be transferred, the ownership, um, and then they were kind of leased back to the Kuwaiti company, or something like that. But it, the, the long and short of it was they flew American flags, and therefore the United States um, had all the legal rights it needed in terms of uh, protecting that shipping. So I, don't, I haven't heard um, whether they're moving ahead with that idea, um, but, the, but that temporary reflagging idea just again points up the gap that we have with the flag of convenience system. And it's interesting that when they were negotiating the UN conventional law of the sea, there is a lot of resistance to this flag of convenience system because it does seem, it seems wrong, illogical, irresponsible to have countries that can't protect their shipping in any meaningful way flagging uh, millions of tons of, of shipping. Um, and so if you look at the UN convention, it talks about the need for a what they call a genuine link between the ship and the country that flags it. But there's been no meat put on the bone, and there's no real, uh, you know, and, and there are obviously a variety of economic reasons. Uh, the, the, the big shipping companies have all the incentives in the world to stay with the flag of convenience system. As, as Professor Kontorovich mentioned, it's the, it's the maritime community, the mariners, the, the, the trade unions, really, in developed countries that have been the, the strongest opponents of the flag of convenience system, but they haven't been able to break through. Um, so it, it, it's, I think it's a, real, it's a real governance problem out there that is not being addressed in a, in a serious way. Yeah, I like this because it's like one of the things that's why, why, why you need to hire a lawyer. Because if you just read the Law of the Sea Convention yourself, you would conclude, it states there quite clearly in the paragraph on nationality of vessels, mm -hmm. a ship must have a genuine link to the country whose flag it flies. And there's a consequence. If you, have a, if you flag with a country to which you have no general, genuine link, under the clear text of the Law of the Sea Convention, you are a stateless vessel, and actually you have no privileges. But getting a, a flag that is not a... However, as... No ship has ever been deemed or judged or treated as stateless for lack of having a genuine link. Not a single one. And that is a remarkable, uh, that is a remarkable fact. But the Law of the Secret Treaty is you know, also an ideological document. That, that is to say, it's part of the UN system. One of the innovations of, of the Law of the Sea Convention, which you have to have if it's going to be a UN treaty, not just the Law of the Sea Treaty of Maritime States, is that any state can be a flag state. Switzerland could be a flag state. That is to say, you don't need to have a port to be a flag yeah. state. So obviously, you know, if you get that, I would argue, if you get a Swiss flag, you should expect less naval protection than otherwise. That seems to be built in. Um, but the fact that that's allowed means that the treaty quite clearly contemplates states that are not going to be of um, much assistance in... By the way, Switzerland had, has sent some help to the Gulf of Aden. Helicopters, and, helicopters and whatnot. So. Uh, you had a, wait, a question from your researcher. No, you don't, because you never know which vessel. From the outside, you can't tell. It's like three guys. You can't tell from the outside. No, no, there were many cases of uh, security details opening fire. They had fairly restrictive rules of engagement. Uh, and so it was what we, I think what we would call the, the club effect. Do you remember the club? It's a big red bar that you put on your car steering wheel. No? Don't do it. So the club is a... That was a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said it. The club was a steering wheel immobilization device that was designed to prevent theft. And it's a big red stick that locks up your steering wheel. And you have a lock in it. You can Google it. So there have been many studies done on the club, and the club seems to reduce car theft. P 
people with the club, we know that it reduces car theft in the sense that insurance companies gave you a break if you have the club. But it, there's a big, open, interesting social science question. Does it reduce car theft or does it reduce your car theft? That is to say, people. so the car thief, it looks like the evidence suggests it moves car thievery away to neighborhoods where fewer people own the club. They, people, they can walk by, they can say, oh, I've got five clubs in the street. I'm going to go to the next street where there's no club. So Somali pirates are not looking for trouble. They're looking for a quick score. So typically, they would break off contact uh, as soon as they were fired upon. And when that became often enough, they, because they have to make up a big upfront investment in the piratical expedition. They buy food and pay people and whatnot. So if they weren't coming back with something often enough, then they go out of business. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't believe, I don't even know if this I don't know if this issue has been resolved. So there was the, a lot of this is done. This is a fascinating area of international law. There's a sort of shadow, not public international law that's quasi-public that's done through regulatory associations like the International Maritime Organization, mm -hmm. and uh, there's mariners' associations, Bincom, and like um, various guilds, basically which meet in insurance guilds, they worked out like sets of sort of best practices rules for how to do this. They have lockers on the ship and they like lock them up and everyone agreed that that would be okay. But there is a, there is a group of British, uh, what do you call them, private security folks, who I believe are still in India in interminable many year legal proceedings because India, I think it must have been something political, but India decided to arrest them when they made uh, when they came into uh, port, uh, and they're still they're still being prosecuted. All right, guys, please help me thank them for coming.